homes. There's no reason that he shouldn't do something for us on this. But let us understand, as far as my motive was concerned, you just don't look at it in terms of words said at a time. You look at it in terms of what you did and what you did later, just two weeks later, uh, after uh, this conversation. Uh, the director of the CIA, Pat Gray, called me on the phone. He said that he thought that some people in the White House staff, I think he said, were wounding me uh, by their conduct. And then he went on to say that he uh, had, uh, was concerned about this contact in the CIA. I said, have you talked to them? He said, yes. He said, they say they have no interest in suppressing or limiting uh, the investigation. I said, fine, go right ahead with your investigation. I didn't stop there. I called in Haldeman Ehrlichman. I said, we cannot have a cover-up. I said, I want to stop this. Be sure that the word gets out to everybody to continue. What I am saying here, yes, we considered the possibility, and I had hoped, for example, that the CIA would find that, that they didn't want the investigation to go forward. But when I was informed that they were not concerned about us going forward, I didn't hesitate one bit. Isn't it true, though, that, that you, uh, the information as it was presented to you and on which you made your decision was that it was a political reason, that uh, Dean was afraid that the money would be traced to the committee, and that's why you approved calling in the CIA in the first place, whatever the other CIA involvements may or may not have been? It was primarily political, as it turned out. My recollection at a later point was of the conversation with Pat Gray. Uh, in which I said, go ahead with the investigation. And consequently, that's why I left the impression, which was incorrect, but what I remembered at the time, that it was not political. It was primary political there. But on the other hand, I would never have approved it unless there had been indications that the CIA might be interested. So there was a subsidiary reason as well. I, I didn't tell, I didn't in effect say, look, get the CIA to get into this thing, whether they're interested or not. I said, if they are concerned, then, of course, the FBI should not go forward. Even given that it was months later and a lot had intervened and that the Gray phone call did uh, direct, your, uh, direct the conduct, how could you forget such a, a central thing that the initial cause was political? It's difficult to understand, but, and uh, again, uh, no excuse that perhaps will explain it. Uh, I had a lot of things on my mind. Uh, I remembered it as well as I could, and as a matter of fact, before I went public on that particular thing, I called Bob Haldeman on the phone. And I said, look, what do you remember about it? And he remembered it exact, exactly as I did. Neither of us, of, of us, of course, had refreshed our memories by l listening to the tape. Do you think that the country would be better off if the cover-up had succeeded and Watergate had never surfaced, or at least had never gone as far as it did, led to your resignation? Ray Price, uh, one of my biographers and my longtime speechwriter, uh, uh, and a very honorable man <laughs> who uh, would feel that any kind of a cover-up is wrong, morally, et cetera, believes that that's the case. Uh, I am not able, really, to be the best judge of that. Uh, certainly, uh, I think that under the circumstances, from a personal standpoint, uh, it would have best been best that Watergate not be expanded uh, to the point that it was. Uh, in other words, uh, to have a misdemeanor become the crime of the century didn't make any sense. Uh, and to have uh, w uh, people today talk about not the crime of Watergate, but the crimes of Watergate. Uh, simply didn't make sense. It was that, of course, that brought us down. People do think about, uh, for example, in the crimes of Watergate, about uh, your taxes that uh, you paid uh, ver little or no taxes during the years that you were president and were probably a paper millionaire? Well, let's just look at my presidency. Except for Harry Truman, I think I am the only president in this century who left the White House with his net worth less than when he came in. Now, that would tend to knock down the thing that I had been profited uh, from my service in the White House. Uh, there was a story, for example, that the Seventeen million dollars had been sent, spent on my place in San Clemente and the one in Florida. I sold the place at the height of the market uh, five years after I left office for two and a half million. And as a matter of fact, what the, uh, US, uh, the GSA had put in there reduced the value. Let me give you an example. Out in California, gas heat is cheaper than electric heat. 
we had a gas heating system in it. The Secret Service thought that a gas heating system ran the risk of fire. They changed it to electric, uh, and so it reduced the value. Enough of that. Coming back to the tax situation, that, of course, was a really low blow. A low blow because I was very scrupulous about my tax returns throughout my life. I, I, I majored in tax law when I was in law school. However, I, of course, didn't prepare my own tax returns. I left it to my uh, staff people who were supposed to be expert in the field. They made a mistake that was understandable. Uh, what happened was that I gave $2 million worth of my vice presidential papers. They were appraised of that to the government. That was common. Johnson had advised that he had done it. He told me that. He suggested that I do it, and previous government officials have been doing it for years. It was a legitimate tax deduction. Then in January, and then in 1969, at the end of the year, I signed a bill, I signed it, uh, in which the Congress revoked that right to tax exemption. Uh, now, as a matter of fact, at the time I signed that bill, I didn't have any feeling at all, uh, and I wasn't doing it with relationship to my own gift of papers, because I had made my gift in March of that year. It had been delivered. My papers had been brought back down from the New York, uh, delivered to the government. So what happened? What happened is that our tax man uh, felt that there had to be a deed of the papers. He wrote a deed out, he signed it himself in my behalf, and dated it at the time that they were delivered. Now, lawyers do that on occasion. In this case, it was made to appear that there was all a fraud in order to avoid uh, the payment of the taxes. So I paid the $300,000 in taxes that I otherwise uh, would have been able to take as a deduction as Johnson and others had done previously. Uh, when I left office, inter interestingly enough, uh, my tax attorneys begged me to reopen the case. They said they would take it on a contingency and they could get the, se the decision reversed. But I had agreed uh, at that time uh, when the matter came up to accept whatever the Joint Committee on uh, Taxation would agree to, uh, what they would recommend. They had recommended that I pay the tax and I did. It happens. When people think about Watergate, they also think about uh, how your administration used the Internal Revenue Service to uh, harass people, and how you even had a, uh, a written-down enemies list uh, of, of opponents to go after and hurt. I don't think, incidentally, that the thought is that I had a written-down enemies list. I think they said there was. A, I think it's been claimed that there was an enemies list within the bowels of the administration the, and so the forth. John and Dean on. Had, uh, the John Dean had collected, uh, whatever that might be. And I wouldn't be surprised. Every administration has its friends and its enemies. We always divide press everybody else up in those categories. You reward your friends and punish your enemies if you can. But do you use the IRS to do that? And certainly not. As a matter of fact, what happened here was simply a natural reaction of anybody in that office. I got reports, complaints as a matter of fact, from friends of John Wayne and Billy Graham that they were being harassed by the Internal Revenue Service on their tax returns, and they thought they were being harassed uh, because uh, they were my friends. Now, they didn't tell me that, but, you know, the word gets to me. When I learned this, I hit the ceiling. And so I said, get the word out, down to the IRS, that I want them uh, to conduct field audits, and that's the way, that's the term, the technical term they use, of those who are our opponents, if they're going to do our friends. And I suggested that one they ought to look into was Larry O'Brien, who would receive very heavy fees from the Hughes organization. Uh, what happened was that uh, uh, the word went to the IRS. Uh, the IRS, uh, as it turned out, <laughs> is often the case, did nothing. They made a big hullabaloo about the fact that we had attempted to use the IRS for political purposes. Uh, and then, uh, months later, Don Alexander, the head of the IRS, put out a report saying that the IRS had not audited anybody for political purposes, not one. So what I am say saying here, that what I suggested was simply a reaction to what I thought was IRS policy that was unfair. I wanted them to be even-handed on it, and I must say that I probably should have gone further in, if I wanted to be political in view of what had happened to me, because I knew from an IRS auditor in California that they got orders directly from Washington to audit my returns in 1961 
when I was running for governor of California. It's the way it works. If you had had more control, would you have used it? Would you have used the IRS to, in, in, in sort of a tit-for-tat way it had been done to you and therefore, does, does that power go with the office? Oh, I would have been tempted. No, I, I don't want to indicate that I was simply uh, going to turn the other way when an opportunity might present itself like that. But what I am saying here is this. We are charged with, we are charged in this Watergate period with enriching ourselves. We did not. We're charged with abusing the IRS and abusing other people and using the IRS for that purpose. We talked about it and so forth, but it did not happen. As far as this administration is concerned, oh, it isn't pure. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it was one uh, that, w that, that is being held to a different standard than previous administrations. I'm not suggesting that because it was done in the past that makes it right now. Uh, I, I don't take the line that, uh, that uh, one, uh, uh, one right, uh, well, what is it? Uh, two wrongs make a right. That two wrongs make a right. Uh, but I do say that two wrongs make two wrongs. I just want a single standard. Do you mean to say that when you were uh, in the Oval Office talking to uh, John Kennedy, when he called you in to ask for your advice and your support at the time of the uh, Bay of Pigs, that, uh, that you knew he was pushing the audit of your income tax returns? Oh, I didn't know that he was pushing it. I assumed that he wasn't. No, I was assuming that was done by some of the very good political operatives that he had in his organization. No, I'm not sure that I don't, th I doubt if he would do it. I doubt if he would do it. I think, however, he, he, he could play hardball. Uh, I don't think he would have minded a bit uh, if uh, an audit came up that was embarrassing to me. I, I know, know, for example, that, uh, uh, that one of the tapes uh, which incidentally have come out uh, since it's finally been revealed that the Kennedy people did tape was a telephone call that he made to Pat Brown after Pat Brown beat me for governor. Uh, he wasn't interested in my political success, and I don't blame him one bit. I wouldn't have been either. He considered me to be one that almost beat him. He didn't want me to come back again. In uh, China, you told Zhou Enlai that you always learned more from your defeats than you did from your victories. What did you learn from Watergate? From Watergate, I think, first, a leader much as he is interested in, as a matter of fact, obsessed by big issues, uh, must not overlook the little issues that may become big. Uh, second, once you have a problem, far better to deal with it quickly uh, rather than to procrastinate because a problem, if not dealt with quickly, is going to expand and become something not only different in size but different in kind, uh, as was the case with Watergate. And third, uh, I would say uh, a leader in those cases uh, where uh, the whole White House itself, the presidency is involved, sometimes it's necessary for him uh, to put his own survival and survival of the institution above his personal loyalties. It's a tough one. The last one would be the hardest for me. And I think it'd be very hard for President Reagan, for example. He's a one of his fine qualities, he, he's loyal to his friends. If uh, following the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, line, the punishment had fit the crime, what do you think would have been the proper, unless you think resignation was, what do you think would have been the proper punishment for what you did or the way you became involved in Watergate? Well, I don't know as it serves any purpose even to speculate on that. There were some who suggested uh, that a proper way to handle it uh, would have been a resolution of censure by both houses of the Congress. Uh, but on the other hand, that didn't happen. I think we've reached the end of our... It's up, I would say 10 minutes, it's up to you. 10 minutes, fine. Yeah. Okay, we'll take the 10 minute here and we'll move it back and do an yeah. hour.
When you got back from the uh, Middle East and from Russia in uh, June of uh, 1974, how did you see your position in terms of impeachment? Well, I guess first I saw it through the eyes of others. Uh, things seemed to be better. Uh, the media seemed to be uh, less vicious than usual, or, and some were even uh, quite objective. Uh, our own people in the Congress felt that the vote count was going fairly well, and uh, the mood was simply better. Uh, but uh, some way I didn't share that. I just had an intuition that beneath the surface things were not going that well. Uh, despite the fact that we had had good publicity out of the Middle East and fair publicity even out of the visit to the Soviet Union. And I guess I can put my finger on it in a couple of ways. You know, politicians, I guess like women, and, and women politicians particularly would have it, that we just have intuition, sixth sense. Uh, I remember so well in 1948, I campaigned around the country as a young congressman uh, for the Dewey ticket. Uh, he was going to win by a landslide. Everybody said he was going to win. I just sensed it wasn't going right. And I remember telling an editorial meeting of the Kansas City Star about three weeks before that I didn't feel good about it. They thought I was crazy. Well, it doesn't show that I'm so smart, but I sensed it. In this case, I think I was worried for reasons. First, for the reverse reason, uh, that uh, we were doing better. I knew that if the opposition felt we were doing better, they would panic. And by panicking, that meant bad news for us. They could not afford, I'm referring now to the partisan Democrats, who were out to get me, of course, and the media. They could not afford to fail now. Millions of dollars had been spent on the Watergate investigation. They had a vested interest in conviction. And so under the circumstances, as they saw the w news get better, they had to do more to bring me down. And then something had happened while I was in the Soviet Union. Here I was negotiating with Brezhnev about arms control and missiles and the rest, and a story came out of Washington to the effect that Rodino, uh, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, had uh, made a comment uh, which he didn't expect to be published, uh, but which revealed something, in which he said that all 27 members of the Judiciary Committee, the Democrats, were going to vote for impeachment. This is before uh, the hearings were even held, uh, and so that concerned me. Uh, I was concerned, too, by the fact that my political position not being as strong as it was, that uh, maybe there would be softness in uh, the Republican ranks. Uh, but, but all of these things caused me to worry. And then another factor. Uh, I knew that with the opposition worrying, they'd put in their first team, and believe me, they did. Uh, Carl Albert, the Speaker of the House, is a very fine man. We'd come to Congress together. He was very bipartisan, supporting me on my in Vietnam and other issues and so forth, uh, but he was not partisan enough. And so they gave the job to Tip O'Neill, who was the majority leader. Now, I've known every speaker since World War II, uh, including Sam Rayburn, one of the great ones. Uh, I would say that Tip O'Neill is certainly one of the ablest, but without question, he is the most ruthless and most partisan speaker we have had in my lifetime. Uh, the only time he's bipartisan is when it will serve his partisan interests. He plays hardball. He doesn't know what a softball is. So under the circumstances, when I heard that he was taking over, uh, shaping up the Democrats, I knew that we were in trouble. Those are the things that worried me before going to California. And yet, I must say, uh, on the 12th of July, just before taking off for California, we had a bill signing uh, ceremony in the Oval Office. And Jerry Ford came up to me afterwards, uh, and he's usually not uh, an overly optimistic type, although he's not the pessimistic type either, but he said, look, he said, uh, <coughs> we got this thing made. We're going to win by over 50 votes in the House. And then Bryce Harlow, who was a real professional, served with Eisenhower, served with me as well, came up and said, you've got it won, boss. Well, I felt pretty good, and yet some way it didn't feel right.
says that the seed is sown on good soil. You uh, say that the, the opponents were the partisan Democrats and the media. It's easy to understand why the partisan Democrats were the opponents, but why were the media the opponents? Well, my uh, fights with the media, of course, are legendary. Uh, it goes back a long time, from the time I started with the Hiss case, the fun crisis, uh, coming back after defeat when they wrote me off and, after, and read them off. Uh, I had read them off after 1962. Uh, so consequently, uh, it is sort of assumed that uh, the media and I are not friends, that we're always adversaries. Now, I think we've got to put that into context. Uh, first, it is not personal. I have some good personal friends in the media. It is not general. Uh, I, there are some uh, people in the media that I respect, that I think are objective, uh, single standard type uh, reporters. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I would have to say that the great majority of those in the media in the Washington press corps, both television and print media, uh, were against me. They have been in the past, they were before Watergate, and of course even more so during Watergate. Now the reasons for that I think are several. One is I'm a conservative, uh, and an effective conservative in their view, uh, and they are liberal. Uh, I'm speaking of those that are against me. The second reason goes to the war. Uh, we just totally disagreed on the war. Uh, I was insisting on and worked for peace with honor, uh, and they wanted peace at any price. They didn't think that at that point we should even continue to try to get peace with honor. Uh, and then I think there was this subtle reason, the subtle reason uh, that in 1972, when the country was voting for me 62%, 78% of the Washington media uh, heavyweights were for McGovern. Uh, I had beaten them, and beaten them very badly. They knew that after the election that I would owe them nothing but a good kick in the seat of the pants. Uh, I don't think they felt that I was going to repress them, but on the other hand, they would like to see that verdict of 1972 reversed. And so what happened was, along came Watergate. Uh, they had the big guns, but we passed them the ammunition, and they proceeded to shoot it right back at us. Now, I know that uh, I've talked to people in the media, you know, we do talk on occasion, and uh, they say, but it's the responsibility of the media to look at government generally, and particularly at the president, uh, with a microscope. Now, I don't mind a microscope, but boy, when they use a proctoscope, that's going too far. You, uh, you use the example. <laughs> you use the example of uh, peace with honor versus peace at any price. Uh, a lot of the people uh, in the media, a lot of people, would say that that's a quintessential Nixonism to uh, to equate the two as if the opposite of what you wanted, peace with honor, was peace with any price, which sounds sort of furtive and uh, and like appeasement, dishonorable peace with honor as opposed to dishonor. Their argument would be that it was a, an unfortunate, unhappy war which was uh, unwinnable, that uh, our commitment was, was wrong, and that the honorable thing to do precisely was to cut our losses in a uh, coherent uh, way and pull out. Uh, they would say that that's a kind of devious uh, setup on your part, and, that, and that's one of the reasons throughout your career why they've opposed you. Do you see any of that? No, they're absolutely wrong, and history shows that they're wrong, what happened in Vietnam. Uh, they felt that we should bug out. Uh, I always knew that if we bugged out of Vietnam, uh, if we failed to prevail uh, there, uh, and the communists came in, first that it would be a disaster, that a bloodbath would come to all of Southeast Asia, and that's happened. 
and second, that it would be harmful to the United States and other parts of the world, and third, it would encourage the Soviet Union to engage in aggression in other places as well, and that's happened. So I would say, when I was for peace with honor, uh, I meant by that, give the South Vietnamese, which we did through the Paris Peace Agreement, a chance to survive on their own, uh, but not to bug out uh, simply because the war had become unpopular. Uh, I, I must say I, I respect their right to disagree uh, with me, but on this I think that my position has been vindicated by what's happened. This isn't really a question of position, though. Uh, do you see that in terminological terms, to say that you were for peace with honor implies that anybody who wasn't with you was somehow dishonorable or for peace with dishonor, even if peace was a desirable end, and that this was the kind of thing that got their back up in dealing with you. Maybe it got their back up, but I, in my view, to let down an ally uh, and to allow a bloodbath to occur, that was dishonor, and I repeat it right now. You uh, flew to uh, San Clemente in mid July. What uh, did you expect to do on that trip? Well, I thought we would have an opportunity on that trip to uh, sort of catch our breath after the, the visit to the Soviet Union and the rather intense pressures uh, that we had been under. Uh, I knew, too, that uh, the Judiciary Committee was going to begin uh, its hearings shortly, its public hearings, and we had to be prepared for that. Uh, so under the circumstances, I, it was a good time for us to take a rest and to look at things from afar in a more objective way. Getting back to the, uh, what we were just talking about, the media, on, a, on, a, uh, on one of my favorite ten-point scales, a ten-point bipartisan scale, how much would you say in terms of the Democrats in Congress and the media that there was a genuinely disinterested bipartisan element or not even bipartisan, uh, that they genuinely were, were felt that Watergate was a serious abuse, that it needed to be investigated, and that, it, uh, that it, the best way to investigate it was through an impeachment proceeding. How much was there that pristine devotion to finding out what the president knew and when he knew it? How much was partisan determination that, that, that it had gone too far and they had to get rid of you or otherwise they would suffer? It was a combination of both. Let me say, I, I realize that the there were some in the media and some in the Congress who felt that uh, for a variety of reasons, because they had disagreed with me in Vietnam, because they thought I was too strong in terms of uh, what I was going to do uh, in the second term, uh, that they felt that it was very important to get me out of there. Let me, under let me make it uh, clear as to what, why they were concerned. Uh, I had not, I had not uh, held any punches back. I made it clear after the election that with the war out of the way, having run, having won by 62 percent, I had a mandate. I was going to reorganize the government. Uh, I was going to cut down on the bureaucrats. I was going to return more power to the states and the people. Uh, I was going to shape up the place. Uh, they knew that. The media knew it. The bureaucracy knew it. The elitists knew it. The establishment knew it. They didn't like it. Uh, and so under the circumstances, I can understand why, whatever their devotion to being honorable and so forth are concerned, <laughs> those partisan instincts might, have, might prevail. But in fairness, of course there were some who uh, weren't partisan at all. They just thought I should be out because they thought I should never have been in. But if you had to guess a percentage of people who were in it for the partisan advantage or because they felt they had to get rid of you in order to justify themselves, as opposed to the people who genuinely thought it was an appalling thing and that you should be removed because of it, what would be the percentage in the media and the Congress? I would say that in just lumping them all together, that uh, uh, in the media it was perhaps uh, about 75 uh, percent uh, that just Partisan. welcomed the opportunity to get me out of there. Uh, about 25 percent who felt uh, had this pristine motive that you refer to. Uh, in the Congress, uh, perhaps 50-50. When did you learn that uh, John Ehrlichman had been convicted for the Ellsberg break-in? On the flight to California. I, I remember it was a, a very shattering bit of news to get on that plane flight. Uh, here Ehrlichman had been convicted, uh, and I thought back as to uh, how unfair life is, how terribly unfair. 
Uh, here's Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg had illegally taken thousands of pages of documents, secret documents, from uh, the Pentagon. He had turned them over to the New York Times. They were published in the New York Times, the so-called Pentagon Papers. As a result of their publications, I know that it encouraged the enemy, uh, that it slowed down our negotiations to end the war and cost thousands of American lives. John Ehrlichman had the responsibility, along with those who worked with him, to attempt to expose this man uh, to see that he had brought to justice, but also to discourage others from doing likewise and to be sure that this man did not do something else in the future. Uh, now, I, I could never understand why they thought that going into his psychiatrist's office would give them some information uh, that would be useful, and yet uh, that's, uh, assuming that's debatable. But they did it certainly uh, with, with the, the intention probably of seeing of recognizing he had done something that was illegal. He had said he was going to do more, which he had. And we had to find out in order to do our job, which was to uh, not only end the war, but to carry on an effective foreign policy. And after all that, what happens? Here, John Ehrlichman's going to prison. Daniel Ellsberg not only goes free, he's made a hero in the media and a hero on college campuses all over the world, country. Now that's just wrong. John Ehrlichman has since, uh, so you, th you think that uh, Ehrlichman got a bum rap? Yes, I do. He's since uh, written a book in which, uh, among other things, he claims that you had a serious drinking problem. He claims that uh, uh, you manipulated the Watergate uh, period to make yourself look good, to position yourself well. How did, uh, when he re resigned, you said that he was one of the two finest public servants it had ever been your uh, privilege to know. How do you feel about him today? I felt that then about his public service. I still feel that. And I understand why he or Bob Haldeman for that matter, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, after having to go to prison, uh, they felt unjustifiably and so forth, after all that they had done, how they would be bitter. Uh, I understand it. How do you feel about John Dean in 25 words or less today? I don't need 25 words. Uh, he did what he did to save himself, and I understand that. In your memoirs, you've, uh, you, uh, in your memoirs, you quote uh, your daughter Trisha's, Trisha's, sorry. In your memoirs, you quote your daughter Trisha's uh, own diary about uh, the arrival at San Clemente and a walk she and her husband took around the golf course. Can you yeah. tell that story? <clears throat> well, the plane finally landed in San Clemente. I was already a bit down because of hearing the news about Ehrlichman's conviction. And uh, I went into the house and uh, we had pleasant dinner. It was a beautiful day, beautiful time, and uh, Eddie and Tricia went out for a walk. When they came back in, they were rather subdued. They didn't tell me why. I learned later why. Uh, right next to my house in San Clemente, where Bob Applenoff owned the property, and uh, some friends out there, they called them Friends of the President, had built a three-hole golf course. And Eddie and Tricia went out to walk on the golf course. It was all grown up with weeds. There were cattails growing in the sand traps. And Tricia was very, very depressed about that. I later told her when she told me about it, I said, you know, in politics, uh, friendship is a very fleeting thing. Unless you can do something for somebody or something to them, the friendships evaporate very quickly. Very few stick around. It was obvious that those who had been friends who helped to build that golf course felt that I could do nothing for them and nothing to them. That was an indication of how power goes away. Isn't that a terribly empty and, and uh, even cynical attitude that politics is only what you can do to or for people? Well, there are some saving graces, however. I said that that is generally the case, but there are also some others who are with you through thick and thin, uh, and those are the ones that you remember. But I've, I've often written, incidentally, uh, after campaigns, and I've been in so many over the years, I write to the winners but I also write to the losers, because having lost, I know that's when you appreciate it. And in every letter I write to the losers, 
I said, you know, when you win, everybody's your friend. When you lose, you find out who your true friends are. Just count me in the latter. Did you find out in Watergate who your true friends are? Oh, yes. Did you have many major disappointments or many major surprises in terms of who weren't or who were your real friends? Not particularly, no. No, let me say that it was very difficult to remain a Nixon friend after Watergate. After all, uh, while the poll showed we still had maybe 25 to 30 percent support, uh, uh, we have to understand that uh, I was simply an unpopular figure. And, and people generally uh, don't uh, want to stick out their necks for somebody who's uh, down. Uh, we're all that way to an extent. What was your reaction? I, the reason I am not that way is that having been down, I can understand people that are also down. I want to help them. But a lot of people just only play winners. That's particularly true in what I call the Wall Street crowd. Douglas MacArthur often told me that. He said, these people here, Mr. Vice President, uh, they are the coldest, most cynical people in the world. Uh, they aren't conservative. They aren't liberal. They're just for uh, whoever happens to be on top. What was your reaction when John Doerr called for your uh, impeachment before the House Judiciary Committee and the hearings were set for the 24th of July? Well, what had happened, of course, was that the day before John Doerr uh, made what I understood from reports was a masterful request for and advocacy of my impeachment. This was all, of course, in closed session. Uh, our own attorney, James St. Clair, who was supposed to be a very fine lawyer, had made what we had heard was a very eloquent defense. But what concerned me was that when he made that defense, the committee then took a vote and denied him the opportunity to make his defense on television. I knew then that we were in deep trouble because it was the public opinion that would affect the Congress if it got close. Uh, once I heard about Doar, uh, I knew that uh, uh, things were moving along. Uh, I, that, that gut reaction that I'd had, I said, this fellow is awfully good. Uh, I don't know how we're going to be able to stand up against this juggernaut. It was just rolling toward us, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. Did you ever uh, feel, given the uh, weight of numbers, that it was a Democratic-controlled Congress, that you could actually uh, defeat impeachment in the House Judiciary Committee? Was that ever a real option? Oh, yes, there was an option, but not of defeating it, but of not losing it in a way that we would lose in the House. Let me explain exactly how it would have worked. Uh, the Democrats had a majority in the House, as we all know. We had only 190 Republicans. Uh, on the other hand, we could always count on assuming even we had some Republican defections, which I expected, not many, but some, we could always count on 50 Southern Democrats, what I call the Joe Wagoner group, conservative Southerners who stood with me on Vietnam and all the other critical issues. Now, in this case, however, with the Judiciary Committee voting, members of the House, I knew from experience, usually voted the way that the members of the Judiciary Committee or any other committee voted in committee. In other words, if you had, for example, a member of the House from Alabama, uh, he would be very greatly swayed in his vote by how the member of the House on the Judiciary Committee from Alabama recommended he vote. So under the circumstances, Joe Wagoner told me flat out, and he was all for us, he said, if we can get just even one vote, we hope to get three Southern Democrats, but if we can get just one, we can still give you enough Democratic votes to avoid the House voting impeachment, the full House. If, however, we lose all, there's no way. All three. That's right. If we lose all three of the Southern Democrats, there's no way that I can hold more than 30 or 35. So it was right down to that count. And when I heard about Doerr's argument, I thought, well, it's going to be tough for any of those Democrats to stand up against that kind of eloquence. Did they? Come to it, please. Okay. I have a... Uh, uh, when you uh... after I well after I heard that incidentally I uh, uh, I did a lot of soul searching and uh, on occasion as is now known uh, I would dictate very late at night usually 11 12 o'clock uh, a diary note uh, they were never transcribed uh, incidentally at the time they were transcribed uh, only after I began working on my memoirs 
but I recall particularly the diary note that I wrote then. It, I reread it recently, and it indicated a mood uh, which was, to an extent, uh, almost resigned to defeat, but on the other hand, held out just a smidgen of hope. In fact, you quoted in your memoirs. I have a copy if you'd read it. Yes. <clears throat> I intend to live the next week without dying the death of a thousand cuts. This has been my philosophy throughout my political life. Cowards die a thousand deaths. Brave men die only once. I suppose it could be said that this is our seventh crisis in spades, because the next month will be so as hard a month as we will ever go through. But we can only be sustained by two things. One, the belief that we're right. We are fighting, as all agree, an assault on our entire system of government. And second, we will be sustained by the fact that at the end it will be over. And even if it is over in the terms of an impeachment, we will just have to live with that. By this time next week, we may have both the court and the committee vote. We can only hope for the best, plan for the worst. Did the worst happen in terms of the support of the three Southern Democrats on the Judiciary Committee? It happened uh, certainly uh, very dramatically. Uh, but I, I would say that in order to get the feeling of that particular day that it happened, uh, it's well to put the whole day into context. Uh, it was July the 23rd. Uh, I went over to the office that morning and uh, we got a report out of Washington, a very disturbing one, not about Democrats, <coughs> but about a Republican. Larry Hogan of Maryland was running for governor of Maryland in the primary. His campaign wasn't getting off the ground. We had counted on him. He was a conservative Republican. But he had announced at an emotional press conference that he was going to vote for impeachment. He was a member of the Judiciary Committee. Well, that shook me. Now, our people in Washington say that uh, they tried to <coughs> and make me feel better by saying that everybody was jumping on him for being so political, but I knew better. His colleagues in the House, watching what Larry was doing when he was down at the grassroots running for governor, would say, well, if Nixon's a liability to him, we better watch out. He might be a liability to us. So I was worried about that, not because he had defected, but because others would be influenced by the f reasons he might have defected. Then came the afternoon. And then the real shocker came in. Bill Timmons, who was the head of our legislative group, called in. He said that we had lost all three Southern Democrats. I don't know that I was particularly surprised, because I had sensed that things weren't going right. Uh, but then Al Haig came in, and he said, you know, we just had a message from one of Wall uh, Wallace's people saying that George Wallace uh, might be able to influence Congressman Flowers who's from the state of Alabama on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and if you'd call him, maybe that would do it, because he has a great affection for you and respect and so forth. Well, I decided to call him. <clears throat> so at 3 o'clock, I picked up the phone. Operator got him in Montgomery, Alabama. He said at first it was very difficult for him to hear me. And finally, when the connection came through, he said, well, he hadn't had a chance to really to study this whole matter. He said, I'm praying for you. He says, I'm very much uh, sorry, I'm very sorry that this ordeal had to be brought upon you. Uh, but I don't feel that I can really talk to Flowers because he might resent my doing so. If I change my mind, however, I'll let you know. The call had taken only six and a half minutes. But as I hung up the phone, I knew it was all over. I turned to Al Haig, I said, well, there goes the presidency. That night, incidentally, I put it in writing. Uh, I worked till over, oh, after 2 a.m. in the morning on a speech on the economy, my last major substantive speech as president that I was giving in Los Angeles the next day. And at the top of my outline of that speech text, I wrote uh, lowest day of the presidency. But it wasn't the lowest day. <laughs> the worst was yet to come. The next morning, uh, understandably, I didn't wake up in my usual early hour. About 9 o'clock, I woke up, I called the office and asked Al Haig how things were going. This was really the first time in this whole period that he sounded really down. He said, well, not good. 
He said, the Supreme Court has just come down with a decision. It's nine to nothing. No error in it, whatever. We have to comply. So we decided we had to comply. Uh, so under the circumstances then, this was a decision about having to turn over tapes to the special right. prosecutor? What had happened was special prosecutor wanted uh, not only 64 tapes, but even more than that. We had resisted that. Uh, we felt that that was going too far. There was a fishing expedition, and the court held against us. Wasn't the, uh, the June 23, 1972 tape, the smoking gun tape, among these 74? It was. And you knew that? It was. That's right. And I, I told Haig of my concern. I had told him about it before. Uh, I told him of my concern, and uh, we both thought that Fred Bazard, our lawyer, should listen to it. He listened to it. He was concerned about it. Uh, and uh, I, he called back and uh, uh, told Haig that uh, he thought it would be very hard to explain it and so forth, uh, having in mind the fact that uh, the only mitigating, and it was a very substantial mitigating factor, was that two weeks later I had said, uh, go forward with your investigation, uh, since the CIA had indicated that it was not concerned about the investigation revealing any of its operative operations. Uh, so I said to Al Haig when we got that word, well, it looks pretty bad. He says, no, we can cope with that. He was, he was a strong man, but of course we couldn't and didn't. I should point out, however, that uh, it was not the June 23rd tape that brought me down, because the very next day, before the tape would ever be made public, before it was made public. I was swimming in the Pacific at a, at a beach. As a matter of fact, it's called the Red Beach. It's the Marine Corps Landing Beach where they practice their amphibious landing, one of the great beaches of the world. And when I came in, and I, the phone rang in the trailer in which I was changing my clothes, and I put on my uh, windbreaker with the presidential seal on, picked up the phone, and uh, Ron Ziegler informed me that the Judiciary Committee had voted as a uh, I had expected then, uh, by a margin, with all three Southern Democrats voting for impeachment. Uh, that meant, in other words, there was no question that the full House would vote for impeachment. Uh, I didn't have any particular feeling about it, though I was prepared for it. I expected it. You didn't, uh, you had to have some no. feeling. No, no, if it had been a surprise, if it had been a surprise, I'd have had a feeling in the pit of my stomach. Uh, but I, you see, I, d I didn't have any feeling about it because the, uh, the situation is, uh, is in a case like that is, and I, I must say, that, let me explain how I operate. I always believe you must prepare yourself for the worst. Then when it comes, you don't get a shock from it. I knew the numbers. After all, I'd served in the House. I had worked with the House in eight years as vice president. I'd worked with them out of office, in office. I knew how they'd operate. I knew the minute that that Wallace call was finished, uh, was it was all over. And, uh, <clears throat> and Al Haig, when he said, we can cope with this, and I said, well, in a way, only if there's a miracle. But you know something about miracles in politics. Miracles don't happen in politics. They don't happen unless you make them happen. I'd made a miracle happen when I saved myself uh, in the fun controversy way back in 1953. I made a miracle happen uh, after losing for president and losing for governor and reading off the press by coming back. Uh, but now there was nothing that I could do uh, to make that miracle happen. Uh, it was reminded me of something that Tricia once said about the whole Watergate business. It was like trench warfare in World War I. Charge after charge over the top, thousands hundreds of thousands, millions dying, only a few yards gain and then lost. And that was the way it was with, us, with Watergate. We couldn't gain anything, no matter what we did. There wasn't going to be a miracle. We couldn't make one happen. So as you flew back to Washington from San Clemente, you had no hope, whatever, that you would survive as president for more than a matter of uh, days or weeks or months at most? From the 23rd of August on, I knew of that July. Sorry. From the 23rd of July on, uh, I knew uh, that uh, we could not survive. Uh, however, when I got back to Washington, uh, in my usual methodical way, people think it's methodical, and I guess it is, uh, I decided I should put down the pros and cons of what options I had. And uh, I had a sheet of paper on that which refreshed my memory. 
uh, rather interesting when I read it today so many years later. It indicated, one, I could resign now. Uh, two, I could wait until the House voted impeachment and resign then. Or three, I could, despite the House voting impeachment, go to trial in the Senate, uh, which would take about six months. Now, resigning now was the option I didn't want to do above everything else personally. Uh, I'm a fighter. Uh, I just didn't want to quit. Uh, also, I thought it would be an admission of guilt, which of course it was. Uh, and also, uh, I felt uh, that it would set a terribly bad precedent for the future. I hope no other president ever resigns under any circumstances. The second option was no option at all, to wait until the House voted impeachment, because what I would do then would be to put all of my good supporters on the spot and make them vote for impeachment, which they didn't want to do. You don't put them through that sort of thing. The third option, go through the uh, Senate with a hearing, uh, I mean a trial, I should say, for six months. I knew that that was unacceptable. Unacceptable because from the standpoint of the country, the country couldn't afford to have a crippled half-time president, particularly in this time when I recalled that in 1973, when things weren't as bad as they were now, the Soviet Union at that time was very difficult during that 73 war in the Mideast. I just couldn't risk it, I felt. So well, after making those notes, I in my own mind decided, well, there's no choice. And so the next day, on the first day of August, this was a week before I finally made my resignation speech, I got in Haig and uh, Ziegler and I told them that uh, I felt that uh, there was no choice but to resign. Uh, Haig felt that under the circumstances that I probably should resign right away and leave town before the June 23rd tape came out. Well, first, uh, I didn't, I just wasn't going to go skulking away like that. Uh, and Ziegler strongly recommended well, I should take the time over the weekend to inform the family uh, and also to see what the reaction to the tape was. I didn't have any hope about the reaction because I knew, I didn't feel that they would see it in the context that I had, I felt it ought to be seen in. Uh, but that's what we finally decided to do. Some people, uh, including people very close in your inner circle, later felt that uh, General Haig was orchestrating a, your departure from at least this point, if not before. Do you see the fact that he, when you told him you were going to resign and were going to wait a couple of days to do it, and he suggested doing it right away, do you see that as supporting that theory at all? You know, some of my very close friends feel that. I don't agree with him. I, I never felt that he was orchestrating it. I think all he orchestrated uh, was the resignation when he knew that I was going to resign. Uh, and uh, I think it was very clear on the 1st of August that the decision had been made. He knew that. And from then on, he felt he was carrying out my, uh, uh, my wishes. Uh, and if he orchestrated that, he was doing uh, something that was very proper indeed. Did you tell your family that you had decided to resign as early as the 1st of August? Not till the next day. Uh, that, of course, is the most difficult thing to do of all. That night, this is the night that I told Hagen Ziegler that the decision had been made. Uh, Bibi Rebozo came up from Florida. Uh, I went out in the Sequoia with him. I told him, and, and I've never seen him. Uh, he's rather swarthy in complexion anyway with his Spanish background, and he just turns white. He said, you can't do it. You can't do it for the good of the country and so forth. I said, well, you've got to help me with the family. And then, uh, so the next day, I uh, had to tell the family. It, it was a painful day. A very, I remember going over to the White House in the evening, and I was sitting in the Lincoln sitting room, reading a few things, uh, working on some correspondence and other things that simply had piled up and had to be acted upon. And Tricia came into the room. And I remember when uh, she came in, uh, it sort of reminded me of other times she'd come in. Uh, she had a way during the years before she was married of sometimes just coming in the room when I would be working or reading there and just sitting. She wouldn't talk, she wouldn't say anything. We kind of communicated in silence. That was her way and it was mine. She just wanted to be near me when things were good or, as a matter of fact, when they were tough. And so she came in and I said, well, I've decided that uh, we're going to have to resign uh, for the good of the country. And I said, she, she interrupted me. She says, for the good of the country, you must not resign. 
Uh, she's pretty firm, despite her rather fragile, frail appearance. And after I said, no, I'm afraid it has to be done. And then, uh, unlike Julie, uh, she has a very great problem controlling her. Uh, she has no problem in controlling her emotions. She controls them very well. And she sort of got up, and she came over to me, put her arms around me, kissed me in the forehead, and tears coming into her eyes, and she said, you're the most decent man I've ever known. And I said, well, I just hope I haven't let you down, but I knew I had. I think uh, we'll break for lunch now. Well, that went very fast. <laughs>